Hi, good morning. I'm Rosalie Schaefer, and I welcome you to the League of Women Voters Hot Topic on Sustainable Growth. Today, we are pleased to have two excellent speakers on this subject. Attorney Ralph Brooks will lead off and cover larger aspects of growth, including statewide trends. Manatee County uh, planner <clears throat> John Osborne will tell us all about his How Will We Grow project about our speakers. With a law degree from University of Florida, attorney Ralph Brooks has over 20 years experience in land use, environmental law, and he's Florida board certified it in city, county, and local government law. In recent years, he has provided his expertise to many city and county governments, such as Bradenton Beach, Yankee Town, St. Pete Beach, Sarasota and Monroe counties. <clears throat> he also advises nonprofits and is an adjunct professor at Florida Gulf Coast University where he teaches environmental and land use law. John Osborne has over 16 years of land use and urban planning experience, both in the public and the private sector. His work has also included extensive transportation planning and environmental related activities in both the public and the private sector. John is a University of South Florida graduate, commissioned officer in the Florida Army National Guard, and serves in the County Emergency Operations Center during its activations. I also want to recognize in our audience County Commissioner Michael Gallen. Thank you for coming today. Okay, uh, after our speakers finish giving their talks, uh, we will have questions from the audience. And please use the microphone, which will go to the um, METV tape so that we have a record of your questions. And please also give us your name. Okay, if we will start with Mr. Ralph Brooks. Thank you for inviting me here to speak with the League of Women Voters in Manatee County. Um, today's talk isn't going to be a speech. It's going to be more as if I were talking to you over uh, coffee and crackers, uh, which we are doing. <laughs> um, I've been practicing land use law, growth management law, if you will, um, for over 20 years. And I have a background that includes not only local government, including Sarasota County, where I was an assistant county attorney, and municipalities like Bradenton Beach on Anna Maria Island, uh, but also environmental groups um, like Sierra Club, Florida Wildlife Federation, Florida Audubon Society, and smaller grassroots organizations like Rainbow River Conservation, Inc., um, the Conservancy of Southwest Florida, uh, which has cases in Naples and Fort Myers and Hendry County, and also representing uh, groups that are trying to um, build things for people, uh, habitat, if you will, um, habitat for humanity of Monroe County and the Florida Keys uh, and Key West, also AIDS help uh, in Key West, uh, which has built facilities uh, for people to live in that have HIV. And I've also represented developers, especially in the beginning of my career when I worked for a law firm in Miami. Uh, we primarily represented developers of large hotels. Uh, I was involved in the redevelopment and rebirth, if you will, of Miami Beach. Uh, when I was going to college, Miami Beach, uh, most people knew by Miami Vice, and they knew there were a couple blocks uh, that had been painted pastel. Um, now, if you go back to Miami Beach, uh, it's, it's really come back and it's wonderful. And to look at certain events that they have there, like the Art Deco Weekend or Art Basel in Miami, uh, Miami Beach has become quite an economic driver for Metro Dade. Um, those types of redevelopment projects and rejuvenation of our urban areas and urban cores I think are very important to Florida and it's a place where we can get the most perhaps uh, jobs for uh, the things that we're looking to do. Um, they have added benefits of 
um, helping housing and creating jobs and creating economic growth and drawing more tourists to the state that I think is probably driven primarily by tourism and retirement at this point. Um, it's difficult to change to new economic bases. Um, I think in the past we had relied too much on construction of what they call green fields or urban sprawl, continually going outwards and outwards uh, beyond our urban centers to try to build new subdivisions, new planned unit developments, trying to create out there what we already had in here in the urban core, but not doing it as well. Uh, after experimenting uh, for 20 years with the cul-de-sac and the single-use, um, single-family subdivisions, um, we are now coming back to, to explore new urbanism and traditional neighborhood development, trying to create in outlying areas uh, miniature villages and hamlets and those types of things. So we've come full circle, I think, in terms of planning. League of Women Voters uh, is concerned with getting people to vote and not only getting them to vote but becoming educated in who they vote for, why they're voting for them, and then staying engaged with those elected officials after they are elected to make sure uh, that they implement the policies that you want. And remember, your remedy if they don't implement the policies that you want is to vote them out next time at the ballot box. Um, we have had experience and some experiments with uh, citizen initiatives, citizen petition drives. Um, I've been at the forefront of that battleground uh, for the last uh, five to six years. Um, in Bradenton Beach, we amended our charter. Um, in town of Yankeetown, we amended our charter. In St. Pete Beach, uh, they also amended their city charter. Um, to allow votes on comprehensive plan amendments under certain circumstances, either by the public in general at a ballot or by a supermajority vote of county commissioners or city councilmen, or some combination of the two. Um, what we tend to forget is that it all comes down to the voters and who we elect anyway. There is no silver bullet, there's no magic pill that we can uh, even put forward as citizens to bypass the voters, bypass the elected officials to say uh, the people will know what to do, direct democracy will have a different outcome or a different result. Um, because voters uh, are driven by what they learn, um, because many voters are lazy and don't take the time to read up about the candidates, read up about the issues, they vote based on 15 second sound bites on television ads. Uh, let's get to work. Uh, all the different slogans and mottos, uh, imagine Florida. All these things are great uh, sound bites. They're two or three words. They don't really establish what the policy is going to be or get into the details of how that policy will be implemented. Um, so it's important that as voters, we realize that it all comes down to us. We live in a democracy, and the outcome will likely be the same whether we're doing things by direct democracy, voting on each individual issue, or by voting for people that get elected uh, because the sound bites, the media attention, the advertising, the campaign contributions going into PACs and into television, into radio, into newspaper ads, into robocallers that call you in the middle of dinner and ask you to vote for a certain candidate or contribute money to them. Um, those, those ways of reaching voters are simply not enough. Uh, you can't decide who to vote for based on those. That all, they all sound good. Um, you can't decide who to vote for based on something that happened in someone's past 10 or 15 years ago. Someone got a DUI. Uh, does that mean you shouldn't vote for them now? Well, what are their policies? What are the other policies that are being uh, balanced against that interest that are being proposed? Uh, you never hear about those as much as you should. So I think that's uh, why I wanted to come here and speak to League of Women Voters, uh, why I want us to learn up, 
as a population of Florida. It's time to cowboy up or learn up or get educated. It's time to let's get smart and find out what we're doing and uh, where we're going and why we're going there and think about these issues. So with that backdrop, I want to lay out for you what's been happening in the last uh, maybe uh, four to six years and I think where we're going now. Uh, we've had two Republican governors. We've had Republican administrations. We're not switching from Republican to Democrat, either in governor or, or in the House or in the Senate. So as in terms of where we're looking here, uh, the majority of the Republicans uh, will have the opportunity to write these bills, to uh, present these bills, uh, to get input uh, from the other side of the aisle. Uh, but ultimately to go to now a Republican governor again and, and things uh, are easier uh, if you have a Republican governor, Republican House and Republican Senate to progress a Republican uh, policy or an agenda. So, and I know we're not all Republicans here, but we are almost all Republicans in Tallahassee right now. So. Um, under the last governor, Chris, uh, he appointed a DCA secretary uh, named Tom Pelham. Tom Pelham, a Harvard uh, Law School, uh, born and raised right here in Florida in a small town. Um, brilliant lawyer. Uh, he was with uh, a, a, a private law firm uh, for many years. Uh, Fowler White, uh, before that other law firms. Um, and when he took uh, the job as secretary of DCA, it wasn't for the first time. He had been a secretary of DCA before, I believe. Um, some of the issues that started coming up uh, were most interesting in the last four years, partly because of the marketplace had changed. You remember um, in 2007, 2008, uh, the housing market uh, started to decline. Um, the prices went down. Many people who had just purchased homes in 2004, 2005 found themselves underwater. They owed more than their house was worth, sometimes by $1,000, sometimes by $10,000, sometimes by $50,000, sometimes by even more, sometimes by more than half of what their house was worth in the beginning. So they saw tremendous drops. Um, we also saw the securitization of mortgages, mortgage-backed securities. Um, what started off as a simple idea, a REIT, a real estate investment trust, by which someone could go into the stock market and purchase a share, and that share would allow them to share ownership of shopping centers, of uh, high-rise buildings uh, in the downtown Miami, office buildings, retail structure, uh, those REITs uh, began the process. But of course, there's always uh, the smartest guy in the room who thinks up uh, another idea and another investment mechanism. Um, at the time, there was not much regulation of these new investment mechanisms. We have something called derivatives that are out there um, that really haven't come to the forefront yet, but may become the next problem. Um, the first problem were these mortgage-backed securities. So people thought up they could take up different mortgages and they could assign them to uh, a trust and then they could sell that trust to someone and the risk would be um, either greater or poorer, uh, higher or lower risk depending on how uh, secure the mortgages were. A lot of it had to do with, one, people always paying their mortgage on the house that they live in uh, traditionally uh, in America uh, when the market is going up. It's a way to accumulate wealth. Um, it's a way to provide uh, assurances for your family that you have a place to live. It's a way to provide for your children and their children's children and stability. And we've spent a lot of uh, our policy efforts in America focusing on home ownership. But when the prices started to crash, the bottom fell out, people stopped paying their mortgages. Um, some because they were looking at it as an investment and it was a bad investment, so they wanted to walk away from that investment. Um, at the same time, we were having um, an economic crisis in that people were not building again. 
They were not continuing to build homes in these approved subdivisions. We had many subdivisions that started and stopped with 10% uh, of the homes or less actually being built in them. So the construction industry that had relied upon the urban sprawl, the continuing to grow out, continually approving new plan developments and subdivisions uh, was in a crisis mode. Um, even smaller uh, builders uh, had trouble. Uh, those who that also worked on remodeling, uh, those who had projects in the pipeline uh, fared better than others, but we've also seen a, a hit in small independent entrepreneurial general contractors and subcontractors. So all this happened at the same time. Eventually it got to the point where you could buy a house uh, from someone in a short sale or on the regular market or from the bank after foreclosure as real estate owned property by a bank uh, for much cheaper than you could build a new home. So building then stopped. Even in the urban infill areas, there was less building. Um, with that going on, we were also talking about how many plan amendments and rezonings and site development approvals and subdivision plat approvals had been occurring. At the Department of Community Affairs, they review one level, that's the bigger level, the comprehensive plans, comprehensive plan amendments. In particular, the amendments to the future land use map that took areas like agriculture and then designated their future land use as medium density residential or low density residential or high density residential or came up with brand new towns uh, new cities, new land use districts that would have their own specific parameters of how many units they would have for single family, how many multifamily, how many square feet of commercial space, and how many square feet of office and retail. And they would combine them and make, a, make a, a, a traditional neighborhood development plan, hopefully, or a new urbanist design to try to contain those trips to stay within the area so we wouldn't just be adding more roads. and per mile people driving back and forth from the urban core to where they lived in the in the hinterlands or greenfields. In 1985 the Growth Management Act was adopted and said plan amendments would go through state regulatory oversight. The state wanted to see what each county and each city was doing in terms of planning for its growth. Plans uh, were supposed to be fiscally feasible financially feasible. They wanted to make sure that we weren't approving at the local level things that we could never pay for down the line. Not right now, but when the homes started popping up and the cars started driving, did we have enough money to pay for the roads? Did we have enough money to pay for the fire stations, for the police stations, for the schools? Um, and where was that money going to come from? And they looked at need. Well, they said in the, from the very beginning, need has been a criteria in the Growth Management Act, which is Chapter 163, and within the, the re regulations that implement the Growth Management Act. Today, the word regulation is a dirty word. No one likes to hear on their three-second sound bites about more regulations. All the people think is, my God, we've got enough regulations. But there were no regulations on mortgage-backed securities. There were no regulations on derivatives. Uh, there were regulations on growth management plan amendments because as the pendulum swings in the past, they had said, we don't want agencies making up the rules as they go along. We don't want something called unadopted policy uh, being implemented by the agencies. We want every, every agency who adopts a policy and applies it across the board to everyone to adopt that as a rule. And we want that rule to go into a book so we can look up that rule and make sure that it's being applied to us just the same way as being applied to everybody else. People were looking for uniformity in policy. And the way to accomplish that under Florida's administrative procedures was to require that every policy be adopted as a rule. So these plan amendments uh, started happening. Um, I have a table with me, which I could show, uh, but I don't have it on uh, electronic format. <laughs> it's the table of land use map amendments to the future land use map um, of counties and cities. And there are 67 counties. And 
with the cities that makes 470 local governments. We don't realize how big Florida is and how uh, much it's divided in terms of counties, 67, and then those 67 counties have incorporated areas that divide those 67 into unincorporated and then into additional incorporated areas. By the time you're done, we have 407 local governments in Florida. Uh, the Florida Association of Counties uh, tries to represent the interests of the Florida counties. The Florida League of Cities offers benefits and represents the interests of the leagues of cities, or all the cities, municipalities. Some are called towns, some are called cities. They're all municipalities. Um, in 2007, we had 702 MAP amendments. In 2008, we had 565 MAP amendments. 2009, 587. 2010, 699. So from six to 700 MAP amendments every year, uh, covering 407 uh, local governments. Um, the act said you could amend your plan twice a year, um, and you could also amend it more frequently for small scale amendments. Um, from 2007 to 2010, we amended the future land use map for 1,905,500 acres. So almost 2 million acres uh, were amended around Florida. Um, much of that area was converted from rural area or agriculture to more intense development. In fact, very rarely do you see a map amendment going from more intense to less intense. Um, the Florida legislature thought it wise that uh, local governments uh, compensate owners if they downzone their property, if they go from one unit per, or three units per acre down to one unit per 20 acres. Uh, the Burt Harris Act uh, makes it possible, uh, if you jump through a bunch of administrative hoops, to receive compensation for that. So very rarely, unless a landowner wants to be downzoned, do you ever see a downzoning. Most of the time, it's an upzoning. So that creates uh, additional residential development potential. In dwelling units, um, we saw one million additional dwelling units be added to the future land use plans from 2007 to 2010. And that's potential. That's not built on the ground. Um, but there's an additional one million. Um, Non-residential. Uh, we saw 2,700,000 square feet of non-residential development potential added to the state's future land use plans and maps. Um, incredibly, we saw quite a big uptick in 2010. I think it was related to a rush to get things approved and receive entitlements that would then be subject to Burt Harris Act if there were down zonings before Amendment 4 the hometown democracy petition was on the ballot. Uh, there was fear uh, that the voters of the state of Florida would adopt uh, hometown democracy amendment four. And that would mean that after every city council or county commission approved a uh, map amendment, uh, and if that was found in compliance with state law, it would then go to the voters. And the voters would directly decide whether that was a smart decision by voting in a referendum on each and every plan amendment around the state in their own cities and in their own counties. Um, because that was a threat, uh, the number of amended acres in 2007 was 300,000. In 2010, it was 1,300,000. Uh, the number of residential units approved additional in 2007 was 234,000. In 2010, it was 530,000. Um, the non-residential development approved in 2007 was 393 million square feet, and in 2010 it was 1,374,000 square feet. Because we'd started approving so much development, I have three minutes? Okay, that's barely enough time to get started. <laughs> I'll be here to answer some questions and can talk some more. Um, 
because that was beginning to happen, the State Department of Community Affairs uh, began to look at need and as a plan amendment criteria more closely. They said, well, you already have this many homes. How many more do you need? And the worry was that they were going to oversupply, over allocate, and further depress the marketplace. Um, real estate is based on th three things, location, location, and scarcity. Um, it's just not the location, it's the scarcity of the location. Um, if it's not about the location, it's about getting a cheap home to live in as your first starter home, and it's about the price. And so that led people to go further and further out because they could afford a, f a home further out where the land was cheaper to begin with the land development costs. So we, that helped encourage this urban sprawl. Um, DCA was worried about are we over allocating, are we over supplying the marketplace, are we ruining our chances to have compact urban development that will help pay for itself by continuing to sprawl out into, into these other areas. So as a result of the latest election, I believe uh, people were concerned uh, by the mottos they heard. The, um, no matter what party they were from, Tea Party, Republican Party, Democrat, Yellow Dog Democrat, there was even a fellow who ran for county commission in Marion County as a Whig, uh, I believe, which was the precursors to the Republican Party uh, many decades ago. Uh, regardless of all that, there were some underlying themes. Uh, people uh, were worried about the economy. They were worried about jobs. Um, they were uh, amenable to this idea that regulations are somehow bad now, even though it's something we wanted before, these policies to be adopted by rules. And so now, uh, Governor Scott ran on a job creator uh, platform, let's get to work. Um, during his campaign, he also spoke about Department of Community Affairs being a job killer. Um, I think that some of the things that people say when they are on the soapbox, like I am now, but not running for anything, if they are running for something, it's easier to say and it's harder to implement. And when you get there and you're new to government, as our governor is, he's an accomplished uh, CEO of major corporations. But when you come to government and you, you're beginning to learn what government does, it, it turns out it's a little bit harder just to dismantle everything or to say no regulations. So we do have some draft bills that have been introduced. Uh, the deadline was last week for new bills. Uh, bills, once they get to Tallahassee, can change. And so many of these bills will transmogrify into something completely different uh, by the time we get to the last two weeks of session. And there's also a budget by the governor, uh, Scott, that's very important. Uh, right now, there's 368 some employees of Department of Community Affairs. Um, he spoke about reducing it to 61. Uh, but the budget only has enough allocation for 10 positions. So there will be 10 positions reviewing uh, 407 plan amendments if we still have review of all those amendments or from local governments, 407 local governments. Um, and there were, if you remember, 2,550 uh, plan amendments between the last three years, 2007 to 2010. What did the bills do? Uh, one of the bills that was introduced and uh, they spoke about uh, last week at the House Committee and Military Community and Military Affairs Subcommittee. They heard comment on more than 200 pages of draft bill language. Um, the important highlights are they would eliminate required state review of many local growth management decisions uh, before the local government votes to adopt. So the, where you turn it in during transmittal, get the state's comments back and make adjustments before you adopt, that would mostly go away. So the local governments would not be getting the benefit of DCA before they vote to adopt. And some of those comments that DCA can give you sure are annoying if you represent local governments. They're nitpicking. Uh, show me where this is in your capital improvements plan in the next five years. And sometimes it's very difficult to comply. But it always resulted in a better plan, I thought. The other one is to repeal the rule, 9J5, and move portions of it, including the definition of urban sprawl, into the state statute. Uh, so that the legislature would now determine what is state spr urban sprawl in the state of Florida if they determine that at all would be done by the legislature and put into the statute. The rule uh, that implemented the DCA's policy, and presumably they would just go by the statute. The statute has much more general language and doesn't have the specifics. They remove a state requirement that roads and schools be in place or planned for new development. So you could put your new development in now ahead of the schools. 
and ahead of the impact to the schools. So we could get further behind in roads and further behind in schools. Um, the thinking that no developer can afford to pay for the roads and the schools that we need now in this economic time. So to create job growth, we're going to prove them anyway and hope that the market rebounds to, w to where they can begin to build these things. But then we'll be faced with the idea how we're going to pay for the schools and the roads and looking for new revenue sources. Provide for state oversight of development near critical state resources, such as military bases and the Everglades and I believe still the Florida Keys, which is an area of critical state concern. So there still would be some state oversight over critical areas, even in these, even in the most uh, um, uh, drastic bills. No one has said throw gov government growth management at the state level completely out the window. Uh, they've just said take Department of Community Affairs, get down to 10 or 50 people, put it into DEP, have them review some important areas, but not everything. That's important to remember. Um, what that does is create a burden on people and citizens like yourselves to enforce the comp plans. Uh, one of the bill here would create a tougher legal standard for you to be able to enforce those plans. Um, they've also uh, proposed deleting the requirement that comprehensive plans be financially feasible. So you no longer have to show financial feasibility for a plan amendment and they would remove the limit that plan amendments are limited to twice a year. You could adopt them anytime you want, as many times as you want. And I'm happy to answer any more questions or bring you more up to date after the next speaker. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Osborne. I'm the planning director of Manatee County, and thank you very much for having me out here today. I'm going to talk about um, something we work on in Manatee County right now in relationship to our, our growth and growth management. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. One of the things that, as a planning director, I am in charge of reviewing uh, the land development applications. I've started the final review before they go to the planning commission, the board of county commissioner. And one of the things that um, over the years in, in our county, uh, through our current growth management practice, our current comprehensive plan, our current land development code. One of the things we probably haven't done, uh, probably uh, uh, the best job at it is, is really looking at the future financial impacts, a lot of the growth that we have approved. And when I say this, I'm thinking about, you know, what is the, what is the impact with, um, for our infrastructure in the long term? When we approve a new project further out east or further northern part of the county, you know, at some point we're gonna have to replace that water line or that sewer line or, and versus what we have, say, here in the urban core. Let me go to the next slide, please. And one of the things that also continues to, to, we continue to look at, especially as our infrastructure ages here in the urban core of the county where we're at right now here in Bradenton, and in the unincorporated part of the county as you move down the 41 corridor, we start thinking about you know, the levels of service of those existing, the existing water lines and sewer lines and roadways. And, and what are the options are there for better land use planning in the county? How can we do things better? How can we make things more efficient in the future, even for our, from a taxpayer perspective and from a growth management perspective? Next slide. So the input we're going around, we're asking a lot of questions. We're asking, we're not getting so specific into saying, hey, what do you want as citizens to see in our evaluation appraisal report? Because probably most of y'all don't really know what an evaluation appraisal report is. But what it is, is essentially it's an audit of our comprehensive plan. And our comprehensive plan is a, is a pretty large document. It's required by state law for us to have, at least for current state law, it's required. It's a big book, it's about this thick, and it's made up of various chapters, and they're called elements. And they cover everything uh, for policy, of goals, objectives, and policies on everything from land use to, to coastal issues, conservation issues, uh, dealing with a port, the airport, transportation, transit, water, sewer, a variety of things, and it's a, it essentially serves as a guide for our, the planning commission, our elected officials, on how to make decisions. You know, what, what's, the, what's the policy structure we're gonna to use to make decisions? That's really what it's there for. And right now, every seven years, we have to audit this document. And through this process, we go out and, and get citizen input. But at the same time, though, one of the things we've, we've really come to recognize over the years is our land development code is, is pretty old. It was developed back in the 80s. And it really supports a suburban lifestyle, a suburban way of, of doing business. Um, we want to make sure that our land development code provides a variety of options for, for, for development, but also encourages the development that is very efficient, not just from 
um, a green perspective, but also a future fiscal perspective. What we have to support for, you know, for essentially for a number of years, for decades on end. Next slide. Next slide. This is a, any section of roadway in Manatee County. And you can see sort of the underground, there's water lines or sewer lines. And every time we build a section of roadway like this anywhere in Manatee County, there's a certain amount of supporting infrastructure. There may be a traffic signal, there may be a transit stop, there may be um, a variety of other utility lines underneath force mains and things like that. And there's also a certain amount of development along the road. It could be stuff that's very low density. It could be in Man an unincorporated Manatee County. We don't have a lot of high density options, but also it could be things like office buildings, things that also provide you a tax base that helps support other infrastructure. Next slide. And click it just one more time. There we go. And you can see well, every time you build a segment of roadway in Manatee County, what you build along this roadway, it impacts a variety of things. Everything from our transit system to more school buses to more libraries to more all the things that we provide services for as a local government. You, you, there, all of a sudden you have a little bit more of a need for these things now. Next slide. So one of the things we want to talk about is just a lot of different there's a lot of opinions out there on this stuff. If you go to a school of urban regional planning, or if you go to you know the the the, D, or the Florida or excuse me the federal smart growth uh, information websites, and there's a lot of different schools of thought on what is good and proper urban and regional planning. Uh, you can be as restrictive as Portland, Oregon, and the city of San Francisco, or you can be city of Houston, which is I don't even think they have zoning right now. Next slide. But there's a lot of different studies out there. I'm just going to go over a few of them with you. And what it is, is this is this graph represents density, dwelling units per acre. And based upon, it also has some things, information on the left-hand sidebar about the cost it takes for local governments to serve that density. And what this graph is really showing you that the real low density stuff on the far right is very expensive to serve. And as you get to higher densities, the cost drops down. This is just one study in one place. Next slide. This is from um, a smart, more of a smart growth based uh, project. This was actually up in Canada, but the dollars are still just take it for value of what the, the relationship of the dispersed type development versus compact development. And this particular study of a particular area in that, of that part of, the, of North America, it was, more, it was cheaper to develop as far as providing services to the compact development than the more dispersed or maybe urban sprawl type development. Next slide. And more of a localized example, the University of Pennsylvania, uh, in association with the Central Florida Regional Planning Council, did a study in 2005 of Central Florida. And there's a lot of actually, with this study, there was actually some things that really rang true and, and reflected some of the stuff that we've done here in Manatee County. There were, they had a trend model, and then they had an alternative model. And the trend model, what they did was they took all, all these different counties and cities, and they essentially, what they, what they did was they took their current comp plan, the current land development code, and essentially said, okay, based upon our current rules and regs, Let's do a build-out model. What, what, what is it going to look like? But also, more importantly, what is it going to cost to serve this, our future here using this, this, this type of growth management? Then they did an alternative model. I have on here a planner's model, but I just couldn't think of anything better to call it. Uh, but essentially what it was, they, made, they, they didn't really make any a lot of crazy changes to the, to the uh, current plans, but they did some really common sense, good urban planning things added in. They made roadways connect to a certain degree. They actually put more schools in communities instead of out on a six-lane high divided highway, so they were a, a, small, a smaller, more localized school. And there's a number of other just little tweaks they did, and they came out with a very different end result from a future fiscal perspective. You know, same future population, different approach. Um, they really also focused in on the investment into nodes. And what a node is, is the intersection of two functionally classified roadways. So it's not two roads in your neighborhood, it's two roads like State Road 64 and Upper Manatee River Road or you know something here in town, 63rd and US 41. So a, a roadway of, of significance where they intersect. And basically what we're saying is you focus some of, some of the redevelopment into these areas that also you can get maybe perhaps provide higher densities, higher intensities, allow something else a little bit different to happen there and give some incentives also to have something more dense and more intense there. Because we also you bring those type of planning into, into play as well. You also have opportunity for a better transit stop as well. Next slide. So what the, some of these planning concepts um, basically say, and you can look at, there's, there's dozens you can look up and research, but low density is a little more expensive to serve from a fiscal perspective, for, for water, for sewer. You're gonna think back to that roadway graphic I showed you. For every linear foot of, of water line and sewer line, 
you, how much are you going to have along that? Are you going to have some mixed use, higher density stuff that helps provide and serve and provide the tax base to serve that linear foot of, of infrastructure? Or are you going to have one house on 10 acres? Now, not a lot to support that same linear footage from a fiscal perspective. Higher density um, is, is, is also, however, expensive to serve. You'll find some studies where the curve starts turning back around once you get beyond a certain point. So sometimes higher density, and it depends upon, there's a lot of variables there. There's a lot of variables with, with how big of an area high density is, how much variability do you have. But just generally speaking, when you start getting above 24 or any particular size area, it could get more expensive for you too to serve. Like again, there are lots of variables. And I went to school for a long time to learn that medium density is best. How about that? Next slide. And that's more of an average to try to get some medium density on average in your community. But our current planning, our current land development code, our current comprehensive plan for the county, it's really a suburban model. It's a low density, our future land use map. On our future land use map, and I'll show you some slides in a moment, that you do have some higher densities on them, especially in our urban core but they're not really realized or built like that today. If you went there and looked to, to go to that Res 16 or that Res 9, you drove out there, it looks almost like any other neighborhood in the county. It was probably built at 1.5 dwelling units per acre, maybe three at the most. It's really not that intense or that dense. Um, one of the things we do here still in Manatee, in Manatee County and the most other communities probably in the country, we separate our uses not just by, um, by miles instead of by blocks or by feet. So our current typical, typical Euclidean zoning separates things quite a bit. So we are stuck, you know, getting into the car and going somewhere. Next slide. We've done a lot of studies on this stuff in the past decade in Manatee County. How do we do things better? And they're sitting on a lot of bookshelves right now. And they're actually, it's great stuff. It's been vetted by the public. There was a lot of citizen input. And I apologize if you can't see these, but there's the Imagine Manatee study. Uh, we also did a build-out study to 2050. We've done the community character and compatibility study and, and numerous others, the one Bay study as well. And it's time to take this information that we gathered, what the citizens wanted us to develop like, wanted us to be like for our future, and really start amending our code and comp plan to getting there to get a better built environment. And all of these really say a lot of the same things. They essentially say, yes, respect our suburbs. However, it's okay to have mixed uses in areas. It's okay to have some height in some areas. We would definitely want open space protected, we want green space protected, but we also want more transportation options. Next slide. <clears throat> this is a study reflecting that what was done actually down in Sarasota. Uh, they looked at, you know, what's that, what are the tax dollars you get from a community? Now, in land use decision making, we cannot, it's, we cannot consider what the future taxable value and the tax revenues is like other states can. That's not part of how we do business in Florida. But just for information purposes, um, some of these are from here and some of these are from other places, but the big box um, in taxable value in 2007, this is actually a, a Walmart here in Manatee County, we get about $11,000 per acre from a tax from them. That doesn't count sales tax, just property. Now, a two-story apartment complex in Manatee County, we get about $18,000 per acre annually. That was in 2007. Uh, and, but also, one thing I didn't really have a great example of a mixed use I could really get a good number on. There, I had an example in 2007, actually it was in North Carolina, and this was a four-story mixed use uh, facility or building. Had retail, had some shopping, had some office, all in the same building. But the taxable value on that in 2007 was 44,000 per acre. So to think about, and think about, go back to that roadway diagram in your mind I just showed you. You know, what, what can you support you know, with that and to help out also, certainly respect the suburbs, but also provides another, a whole other opportunity for us to do better planning in Manatee County and other places to provide opportunities for this type of development to occur. <laughs> Next slide. I apologize, this is kind of tough to see, but what, what the picture is, is of uh, the county. And that big red line on the right is our future development area boundary. And this line uh, was actually put into place. It's about halfway through the county. And this is a partial graphic of the county. There's more that's off the screen. And there's that little part that sticks down. But that line is about halfway through the width of the county. And essentially, it's like the face of the Manatee Dam, if you drew a line north and south of the county. Just to give you kind of a, a, a visual about where that is. And what that line does is basically it's sort of the end of the world of our future utility system. And this line wasn't created by urban planners as a magical line. This is actually was created by utility engineers back in the 70s to say that if we ever built out the three plants we have to their maximum potential and based upon uh, topography and some other things with a gravity-based sewer system, that's probably the end of the world for us. That's probably about all we could serve is that area if it, growed, if it grew at a, at a more of a suburban model. Next slide. 
So you can see that line still on the red hand side. We, we respect that line today in our comprehensive plan. Uh, you can also see all the roads that are in now. And you can see we're starting, we're, we're creeping toward the line. We're, we're getting there. Liquid Ranch is certainly creeping that way. And of course, in the parish area of the county, we're, we're creeping that way. And these colors on the map is our future land use map. And the future land use map in Manatee County uh, was originally uh, adopted by the original comp plan back in the uh, late 80s. And uh, there's a lot of areas on here uh, that are low density. There's an area, if you look at Parish, uh, right below that big red blob there, there's a big yellow area. And the yellow area goes all the way down to Upper Manatee River Road and Sarah 64, and it kind of swings up around to the port. You see that big area right there? That, that's called Urban Fringe 3. And Urban Fringe 3 is essentially more of a bedroom community. It's planned that way. Um, you can't do a lot in there. Certainly you can build a golf course community. You can build a lot of low density, density residential. You can't really get a, build a lot of stuff where you have employment. You can't really build a lot of stuff where you have other opportunities for mix of uses. It's more, more difficult to do. Um, you certainly can have a Publix at every corner, but to have a doctor's medical office complex or something like that, you really can't do that kind of stuff there. So it's really limited in its future use. So essentially we have this, this big, huge area of low density residential that if you look, compare it to some other developed parts of the county, it's a massive area. And if we're, one of our concerns is this develops all as a bedroom community, we, when, a, when you create a bedroom community, you create essentially a huge transportation sending area. You'll never be able to build, if that built out, you'd never be able to build roads big enough, wide enough to really make it work effectively, unless you provided some opportunities for other uses there to sort of capture some of that traffic in there. Next slide. Some of the colors just changed. I know it's starting to look more like a church window here, but some of the colors actually more reflect our water and sewer system, some of the lines that are in place now. So you can kind of get more of a feel about how far we're reaching out with our current utility infrastructure. And when development comes on this side of the line of the future development area boundary, we, we, they do are required to put in water and sewer. Next slide. And now there's other colors that's been added on here. And the purple colors and some of the other light blues are really getting into some of the more specifics on development trends. But you can see now the colors have really starting to fill in a lot of the area up to that line. And this is where we have essentially over the past, you know, three, four, five years have approved more development and it's creeped that way. Not to say that there's actually dirt being turned right now because of sort of the bust in the economy, but there's also a lot of large hurdles if people wanted to develop these sites today. There are some major hurdles they would have to go through with utility extensions and other things of transportation improvements. It's a lot of stuff that has to happen to start having you start before you'd see more roads and water lines and sewer lines get up that way. But essentially they have sought out entitlements for those areas. Next slide. Now having said all that, we're kind of turning it back, hold back to another direction in Manatee County here. This is the University Parkway and 301 intersection. And when we started getting into questioning, you know, citizens back with Imagine Manatee, the community character study, and some of the other plans we've gone out to the community with, we've asked you, you know, where should growth go? And you know, one of the things that we have a lot of in Manatee County is areas just like this, where you can look and, and we, here's the technical planning term for you, cows in town. We got places in Manatee County where there's water, there's sewer, there's schools that have maybe some capacity. There are, uh, it's already served by, there's a library somewhere near here. There's a lot of different infrastructure we've had in this area historically that may be even underutilized. And how do we help, you know, when we still have a certain amount of people coming here, it's still snowing up north, how do we try to steer development to a lot of these type of areas? This is an area that, if you're all familiar with the One Bay exercise that took place um, with the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council, they were down here and had some, those Lego exercises where, you, where you, all the citizens come in and sit down and you have a little Lego building block. And basically it represents a certain number of people that are coming to, coming to town. They're, come, they're moving here at some point. Where are you gonna put them? And this is one of those areas that there was a pile of Legos on. Next slide. I talked to you about nodes a little bit ago. And nodes, again, are the intersections of major roadways in Manatee County. And this shows you basically where all, the, all those nodes are in Manatee County. And actually some future nodes that don't exist yet. Back when the development boom was really cranking along, we actually had uh, to do some future roadway planning for projects. So some of the, some of the roads out there that are, aren't there right now, we do have plans to, to put them in based upon certain projects coming in, future dedications of right of way So we're trying to do a better job at planning some of those farther northern and eastern areas of the county as projects came in. But the thing about it is it kind of shows you too, if we start doing more nodal based planning of where, the, where these places are. If we allow higher densities and more intensities in Manatee County, these are probably the places that are better suited for that to concentrate them at nodes. It's better for transportation circulation, for more transit opportunities. Next slide. 
Now the purple that just kind of came up on there, this is, this is the one bay, the Lego building blocks. The darker purple areas are where there were more blocks, and the lighter purple areas there were fewer blocks, but still there were, there were blocks there nonetheless. And so you can kind of see, this, these are the areas that the citizens, back in all these public visioning exercises we had that said, if you have all these new people coming here, this is where they should go. And you can see a lot of darker spots, spots in town. You know, the need for doing better work, a better job by your local governments on providing more opportunities for urban infill and redevelopment, but also providing opportunities at some other places in the county as well for higher densities, for more mixed use opportunities. Next slide. This is essentially overlaying that same information on the future land use map. One of the things I used to be a Cub Scout leader and I used to teach kids how to read topographic maps. If you think of your knuckles, if you draw the same size circle, the, the smaller circle is the top of your knuckle, it's the most tense place, most highest place. So that's the, the darkest purple areas are the smallest circles. So you kind of see how some of those areas overlaid versus our future land use map. You know, some of the areas are, are tracking. Some like in the bottom left corner, we have some opportunities for higher densities and intensities. But when you get out to some of the areas like I talked about before in Parish in northern parts of the county, well, that's that urban fringe three area where there's not a lot of opportunity to really kind of make a space for a lot of these folks to come in as the citizens envisioned. Next slide. So how will we, how will, will we grow? You know, we're actually going to be presenting a few options to the Board of County Commissioners. Um, one is stay the course. When I say stay the course, we're still going to plod forward with incremental changes where there's still things that need to be done. There's still things that need to be changed. Certainly it could be done incrementally if the board isn't comfortable with making major changes to a lot of these areas that I showed you. There's also an option for urban infill redevelopment and also an activity center option, which is a little bit different too. Next slide. I'm kind of go, I know I'm limited on time here, so I'm going to go through these a little bit more quick. But staying the course, again, it's not stagnant, but, but make incremental changes. Next slide. Urban infill will really kind of look at how do we redirect this future population growth? How do we kind of do more concentration on providing opportunities for new development and redevelopment in our urban core? That, that's the tough one. And I, I, back in the past and my previous years of working in the private sector, I represented clients that actually sometimes wanted to do urban infill redevelopment, but con the concurrency rules made it very difficult. It was very easy to develop in, in virgin land out east than come in, the, in town and have the myriad of issues that are, you're faced with, with upsizing 60-year-old utility lines and things like that. It's very difficult. It's very expensive. And sometimes, the, the, and in a lot of cases, the costs don't outweigh the benefits. But how do, we, how do we switch that around? How do we turn that around? Next slide. Again, there's some opportunities in, in other parts of the urban core that says Res 16. I mean, there are a lot, there are a lot of places in the unincorporated county where you actually can build some density intensity, but if you went out there and drove out there today, there's probably not a lot out there. Next slide. ROR is retail office residential, and that's the places that's really all, all on the 41 corridor where you can actually have some higher densities, even up to 16 dwelling units per acre. So there's a lot of opportunity for redevelopment, more transit-based stuff, more mixed-use opportunities along that corridor. Next slide. <clears throat> One of the things that we're looking at doing is taking a lot of the information that was provided to us before with that character study, Imagine Manatee, and how do we get the code switched around so it's not a suburban-based code but also provides an incentive for urban redevelopment. Next slide. Option three is, is the, the four areas of um, concentration or four activity centers we're also looking at. And again, so there were three options, you know, stay the course, Focus so the option two, focus solely on urban infill redevelopment. And the third option is maybe concentrate on four areas of the county and then focus our capital improvement dollars on four specific areas. Next slide. So these areas would be the poor area of the county, which is our economic activity center, the parish village area, the 41 corridor, and the Lakewood Ranch area. Next slide. And these, these aren't hard and fast lines. It's really more of a you know, paint splatter to show you where those areas are at. Lakewood Ranch um, does things with develop, as a development of regional impact with as a certain land development application type. Uh, in, in Lakewood Ranch, we do get looped utility systems. We get places for fire stations, places for schools. Uh, so it's, Lakewood Ranch is a little bit different. And if you look at that in comparison to the parish area, where we have a lot of small landowners, and it makes it very difficult to do a lot of good planning in that area when you have a lot of different applications coming in. But next slide, and next slide. So the third option really is looking at creating these, maybe the opportunity for these four activity centers. Now, uh, we have a website that you can go to for more information on this project. And it's actually, if you go to mymanatee.org, and then after the forward slash, put in uh, manatee plan. 
and this information. You can download this website. And there's also we're having some other opportunities for more public input. Uh, actually, this week and Thursday, I'll be at the Manatee County Utility Complex uh, in the evening for doing a similar presentation for the citizens out there. And we'll have some other ones coming very soon. But I just want to thank you for your time today. Uh, if you have any information or thoughts on this, we also you can, you can go to the website, and there's opportunities, and, and there's an email address you can submit comments to and suggestions to. But thank you very much for having me out here today. entertain questions from the audience if both speakers could come back up please use the microphone and state your name while you're thinking of a question um, I just wanted to say how important it is with the state legislation that's going on the message is clear that planning decisions will be made first and foremost by the local governments so your county planning commission, your county commissioners, your city planning commissions, your city councils, that's where you need to go and be engaged in this planning process because that will be the final say. In most cases, there will not be state oversight, so it's up to the cities and counties, which is yourselves, to do it correctly the first time. I'll ask one. I haven't heard the word Oh, I'm Sandy Ritberger, and I'm a conservation chair with Sierra uh, in Manatee County. Uh, I haven't heard the word sea level rise. I know some politicians think it's sort of a dirty word, but a lot of communities are planning with that very much in mind. And I wanted to ask if Manatee County is, is considering it. Yes, yeah, Sandra, we are. With our evaluation and appraisal report, which is the audit of the comp plan, we're actually doing some research right now on sea level rise. I believe there's a more recent federal federal report that came out and had some specific maps in it, and we're looking into that right now and what its impact is on Manatee County. And that'll be in the form of that evaluation appraisal report. We'll have some, once we have that initial draft put together uh, of that document, that'll be available for the public and public review as well. But if you have any thoughts or comments on that subject as well, or any other information you'd like us to, to look at, please feel free to email it to me. On that same issue, um, I found it interesting. I was up in Marion County, and they were reviewing their ear-based plan amendments, where it comes after the ear, and they actually adopt into the comprehensive plan. And a few of the commissioners said, what is this stuff here about uh, clean energy, uh, road efficiencies, global warming? Well, why are we talking about this? Why are we, why are we doing this? And the planning director said, well, this is a requirement of state law that you plan for uh, better efficiencies, clean air, and f climate change, and uh, sea level rise. And they said, well, that's ridiculous. I don't think we should do this. I make a motion we take all this stuff out. And the planning director said, well, no, it's actually required by state law, so you have to at least address it. Um, so there is a mentality, I think, that you need to be aware of and be careful of, of saying just because it's not happening tomorrow, it's not something that we need to plan for in the future. Major corporations uh, are planning for sea level rise. Um, look what happened in Japan uh, this weekend with the earthquakes and the tidal wave and the nuclear radiation facilities and, and, and all the things and the people lived along the coast there how when they were inundated with water what happened. Punta Gorda in uh, Sh Charlotte County um, is putting together a sea level rise uh, policies in their uh, comprehensive plan and in their land development code talking about extra feet on their seawalls, about retreat, um, about restoration. So the, all of these things are particularly important in a place like Florida where the majority of our population lives along the coast. 